Hello and welcome to PMI's Uncommon Sense podcast, tools to improve your work forever. I'm Susanna Clark, Managing Partner with PMI, the Performance Improvement Consulting and Training Firm. Our Uncommon Sense podcast is a 15-minute conversation with our expert consultants. They talk a lot of common sense, although much of it is not common practice. And that's what this podcast is all about. We want you to be inspired to improve your business through learning more about the tools which can help you succeed and grow. Today, I'm joined by Damien Albinson, who's Senior Consultant with PMI. Great to have you with me today. Thank you very much for your time, Damien. Thank you very much for having me. So today we're going to talk about roles in process management. And it occurred to me when you mentioned this was a topic that you thought would be great to bring into Uncommon Sense that actually many of our listeners have already got a job role, whatever that may be. They've got a title, they know what their role is and so on and so forth. So I, I guess they would be questioning, well, what do you mean roles in process management and how does that work given I've already got another job role? Yeah, uh, which is a really great, uh, a really great starting point actually to talk about all of this. So, um, so yeah, I do want to talk to everyone about these these roles, these job roles. But I'm not suggesting for a moment that people suddenly are expecting to go back to their boss and say, "I want to change my job role," or "You need to change yours." That would all get quite messy. Um, so, before I go into the detail on the roles themselves, I just want to stop off briefly and talk about the the concept of of process thinking. Um, you know, if we can describe any work that's done in, in any business at various levels of detail, uh, simply as a process, a process is something that converts something into something else is the very simplistic way to put it, or the, the transformation of inputs into one or more outputs, if you want the more formal definition. So, of course, so we have these processes and and they need to be owned and managed Okay, just like we'd say for any other business assets that we would we might possess, like buildings and expensive equipment and that kind of stuff, we'd expect they need to be owned and they need to be looked after and managed and hopefully improved. Processes are the same. So um, what's different with processes though is that they're they're not necessarily you can't always see them. You have to you know define them and work out where they are and how many steps make them up. Um, so when we talk about these roles, we're talking about people assuming this kind of additional responsibility on top of their existing job role. So the job role of the person, t- to some extent, is irrelevant, um, but there is a kind of a relationship between where you might be in the business in terms of its hierarchy and the sorts of how that might transition over to these uh, assumed um, process management roles that I want to talk about. And I'll highlight that as I talk a little bit more depth about them. Okay. Okay. So it's not a, it's not a different role. It's a, it's a bit like, as you say, we, we have assets to look after that could be equipment, could be people. Yep. And it's a bit like assigning the responsibility for the processes much more clearly to people. Yeah. Sure. I suppose it's analogous to, you know, I'm sure in, in most offices and factories and warehouses that someone is a fire marshal and someone is a first aider. That's not their yeah. full-time job, but they assume that role in the event that we have the need to use it. So this is kind of like that, except we're assuming these roles constantly, uh, not just in the event there's something happening. So Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so tell me more. So the first, so we have, there's only four. So there's four different titles. I'll just get them all out of the way now. So we talk about a system owner. Um, we talk about a process owner, which is one level beneath the system owner. We then talk about process managers and process operators. So some of these those might seem like an obvious transition, others maybe not so clear. Uh, and that's it. it. So it does make things a little bit more simple. Um, so let's start with the, uh, let me give, give, give a summary of each, I suppose. So the system owner is um, the person who we would say owns the entire business system. So all of the processes, no matter how many you have, um, and their role essentially is to look at the appropriateness of that system. And is it capable of satisfying the customer's requirements? 
both now and into the future. So they're typically taking the more strategic position. Uh, you know, where do we need to adapt and improve? Um, have we got the right, you know, measurements in place? Uh, and, and what's the customer saying? You know, are, are we getting the sense that, that we're doing okay for them? Do we need to develop new products or services in the future? So it's typically how it would translate back to the the, the existing job roles. They might be heads of uh, entire regions, probably even C, uh, CEOs, uh, mm-hmm. managing directors. Those people that are really kind of very much at the top uh, and can pull those strings to to change the entire organization. So that's the the system owner's position. And I guess that also there will be a degree of variation depending upon the size of the organization. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, then we have the process owner. So process owners are quite interesting because I think this is where there's probably more variation depending on size and complexity of businesses. Um, but the, the, what we would want the process owner to be is who then, so we have these high level processes that make up what the business does. Um, and so you could take a typical business, you might say we have three or four kind of, let's say product or service streams that we offer from right from uh, customer, you know, first engages right the way through until that's been fulfilled. So the process owners in simplistic terms would own those. So they would own the entire end-to-end process. And again, this would be a nomination. So it could be someone, probably someone who's already fairly senior and could then assume that responsibility. And the reason why these people are so important is it's kind of like, well, if you think of the complexity of delivering anything in an end-to-end process, there's lots and lots of people involved. There's many, many different functional areas involved. There's various transactions taking place left, right, and center. Now, down there in the detail, there might be all sorts of people trying to improve things and change things and whatever, adapt things. Um, Who is going to coordinate all of that? It's like having a bunch of musicians on a stage and saying, well, you know, unless someone coordinates the whole thing, like an orchestra, in which case that would be the conductor, it's they're not going to actually play well together. Yeah, even though on themselves, they're very talented musicians. It's the same analogy back to a business. We have all these people very talented and skilled, but we need some coordination there to make sure that the right things are being worked on in in the right priority. So the process owner's job is, again, to look at, is that process delivering for its identified customers? And they can coordinate things across these functional boundaries in, in those interests. So again, they're much like the system owner, they're working, their focus should really be to work on the process rather than in it, <laughs> which is always a difficulty when you're fairly senior, you get dragged into the details all the time and you know, you're know you actually part of the actual process rather than working on it in terms of improving it and, and uh, controlling it. Mm, okay, yeah. Uh, sitting beneath the process owner, we then talk about the process manager role. Now here we might have many, there could be many, many managers across a, an end-to-end process that look after various process steps. Um, and this is, their role is really vital because what we want them to do is is actually work in the process. We want them to focus on the day-to-day. Um, and the way that we train those individuals, because we have different training assigned to these different roles, um, we train them to follow a cycle, a continuous cycle made up of three elements, uh, standardize the current process, maintain the current state, which includes to measure it and respond to issues, and then improve. How do they improve it? And we're, when, we, when we're talking about improvement here for these people, we're talking about the small I improvement. We're not talking about big radical transformational projects or anything like that. Um, we're just talking about the day-to-day. How do we continuously look at making things slightly less variable, slightly less wasteful, responding to problems as well? I mean, if we do that in a structured way and get to very robust root causes and what we call corrective actions, that in itself can be seen as improvement. It's making the process more reliable, more consistent, and so on. So they have uh, quite a bit to do. Okay. And sorry, I was just thinking back to sort of, you know, when we were talking about sort of depending on the size of the organisation, again... Yes, there may be many managers, yep. but there also could be managers doing similar jobs in different parts of the world, but within the same company, for instance, or at different sites, but within yep. the same company. And depending on how they're structured, you've almost got 
not quite clones of yourself, but somebody. And so there must be a, a re- ideally a requirement for those managers to also share with each other. Yeah, either the managers or especially the process owner level. So let's say we've got three regions. You know, we've got the European yeah. region, the North American region, and the Asian region, or something like that. You could then have process owners for each of those. So, so within them, there's there are those you know clone process managers in in the re, in that they manage the same process, it just happens yeah. to be in a geographical different location. Exactly, and the practicalities around that it just make it sensible to to slice it that way. Yeah, um, but there's fantastic opportunities in those situations for um, particularly with problem solving, which I just was just talking about, where we get to share best practice. So if we have a process in one region and we found a, a, a really great fix to a certain issue that's maybe quite common. Why wait for the other region to f- to have the same issue and, and reinvent the same solution or probably something different is more likely. Why not share the best practice? So there's an awful lot of horsepower you can get from this system where um, we set up the right networks for sharing that learning that we get from the daily management that actually helps the entire business or the entire Enterprise, let's call it. Mm, yeah. mm. Great. And then finally, underneath, working underneath the process manager, doing the actual daily work is, of course, the operator or the operators. And um, and what we'd expect the operators to do is to adhere to the agreed standards that we've set up or that we're constantly improving um, and contribute to improvement. So we and, and most operators I meet, they don't they rarely get the opportunity to do this. They might have maybe a suggestion scheme or something which often don't perform as well as people would like. I could do a whole different <laughs> whole different <laughs> podcast on that one. Well, uh, I'll make a note of that. Uh, yeah, I'll make a note of that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, they don't they, they might have well they they usually are just full of ideas. They've got all kinds of ideas for improvement, but there's rarely the mechanism to manage all of that. And on the one hand, we don't want them going off and trying things out uncontrolled because then by definition, we don't have a standard anymore. And some of those changes could actually cause harm uh, or even get themselves into trouble. But on the flip side, we don't want to say to them, once you have a, a, a routine way of doing something, that's it forever. And, you know, to switch your brain off when you come in in the morning. We do want the ideas. We just have to then coordinate and control how we explore them in the right way. Uh, and do that scientifically. And that's the process manager's role. So one of their main responsibilities is to constantly encourage these operators to challenge themselves about the current way we do the work. You know, is there a better, slightly better way of doing it compared to how we did it yesterday or the day before that? And if we constantly keep that consciousness of that question there, these ideas will keep coming out. Uh, and, uh, And then if we engage them in the right way, and they have a positive experience from that, they'll want to keep doing it, right? They'll want to keep improving. And that is continuous improvement. That, that is... In and and sure. this system of roles communicating with each other to create that continuous yeah. improvement sort of up and down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it seems like a relatively straightforward model because it is. Um, I think the prat- practical applications of it are somewhat more challenging because, like you say, there's these complexities about size of organization and geographic locations and so on. Um, but I think the biggest hurdle that gets in their way is just that idea of who would these people be? And and um, particularly process owners, I think. Um, now, what I probably could accept is that you could have an owner who owns a certain portion of the end-to-end and then it's handed over to someone else. So you- maybe split it in half. Someone looks after the front end, someone looks after the back end. Uh, but ideally, it's just one person that looks after the whole thing, or at least is nominated to play that role uh, aside uh, their normal day job. Okay, great. Thank you. That's that's really clear. I really understand that. And I really like the 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 sense of being able to scale that as well, that yeah. it, it, you know, across different locations and so on. Really good. Thank you very much, Damien. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. You can find more episodes of our Uncommon Sense Tools to Improve Your Work Forever in our Knowledge Hub on our website. Or, of course, your favourite podcast platform. And do subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode 
where you'll find links to more content on this topic, which includes webinar recordings, toolbox guides, blogs, and infographics, and our training page. You can always drop us a line on team at pmi.co.uk and arrange a time to have a call to talk about how these tools can help you in your organization. We'd really love to hear from you.